What are you reading? Hi. It's the Holy Quran. But isn't the Quran only for Muslims? Not at all. Its teachings are addressed to all humanity, from heads of state right down to everyday people like us. What does it teach us? Well, it's a book of life for life. No thinking person should pass through life without it. How interesting. Where can I get a copy? Easy. At a cost of only five rand. From the IPCI, 124 Queen Street, Durban. Dear brothers and sisters, it is my pleasure on behalf of all of, of the society's board of directors and on behalf of all the brothers and sisters to welcome and introduce, and introduce a personality who really no, needs no introduction. However, brothers and sisters, we have the honor of having among, among us tonight in this holy place the great Muslim scholar of international, of international fame, Sheikh Ahmed Didat, who has kindly accepted the invitation through the Ministry of Information and Culture to speak to us about very essential subject, which will be about the role of Masjid in West. Who please, Sheikh Ahmed Didat, welcome. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ادع إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموئزة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي أحسن إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو أعلم بالمهتدين صدق الله صدق الله مرة العظيم Mr. Chairman, and my dear brothers and sisters, I understand that in the adjoining hall, our sisters are also being catered for by means of a TV screen. So I said, my dear brothers and sisters, though I see only brothers before me. The topic that has been chosen for this evening's discussion is the role of the mosque in the West, the Masjid, the Masjid in the West, people, Muslims, we, we are in a minority situation. There are Masjids there. Masjids in places like London, Paris, Berlin, Washington DC, in South Africa, Durban, Johannesburg, Cape Town, these are all Western places, Western countries. And what is the role? What can they do? What can we achieve through these masjids? And how the people in these respective countries, how do they look to the mosque? The masjids in the West are really a challenge to the Western nations. digs right into their hearts, like the minarets are going deep into their hearts. Masjids in the countries, in their own countries, in England, the land of the Anglican Church, cathedrals, in France, a proud daughter of the Church of Rome, and now the Muslims are contemplating a masjid in Rome. It hurts them at their dear heart. And Islam is a challenge. It is a challenge to all these Western nations. In my country where I come from in South Africa, we have more than 300 masjids in the country. We are a very small community. We are barely half a million, to be exact about 400,000. And we have more than 300 masjids in the country. We have more than 300 madrasas, religious schools in the country. We produce hundreds of hufas in the country. And we are a challenge. 
Similarly, the Muslim, wherever he is, is a challenge to the Christians in their land. In South Africa, for 300 years, they have been trying to hammer the Muslims into Christianity. And after 300 years, they failed. They started uprooting us under a type of law of segregation, separating the peoples. So the cities, wherever we lived before, we had our masjids around where we lived, and they felt that those were better areas for the whites, the rulers of the land. So they expropriated our lands and made us to leave and go out into the world, outside the cities, starting new settlements. A place, something happened like that in Johannesburg. They pushed us out 20 miles out of the city. We had to leave our masjids behind. In the Cape, in Durban, we have to leave our masjids behind as monuments. But where we land in a new place, we put up 11 masjids with 11 minaras. Every masjid with a minara. Of course, we can't compete with anything you see in Abu Dhabi. You know? Every which way you turn, you see the minarets of masjids, mashallah, minarets of masjids. No, we can't compete with that. But in our own little way, you uproot us from one place, we put up a half a dozen minaras in another place, shooting into the sky. And we are a challenge. After 300 years, they failed to change us, they failed to convert us. We are an eternal challenge. In the West, same. Our Regent's Park Mosque, Masjid in Regent's Park, London, a beautiful structure. I visited this masjid a number of times. And the last time I went to Regent's Park Mosque, Islamic Cultural Center, yes, I had with me a booklet a small book. I have a photo stat of that. It was in color, glorious technicolor, and it said Islam comes to Britain. And is the minaret of the Regent's Park Mosque. And I showed it to Dr. Muharram, the head of the cultural center in London, Dr. Muharram. I showed him this booklet, beautiful booklet it was, this is in black and white, because it's a photostat. It says, Islam comes to Britain. So Dr. Mukharam tells me, this is our masjid. I said, yes, but I said, you didn't print it. This is printed by the Christians. So you are very happy, this is our masjid. But I said, you didn't print that, it's the Christians who printed it. You know why? No, he doesn't know why. I said, you see, they are trying to terrify the Christians of Britain, of UK, England, Scotland, Wales, terrifying them that these guys are coming, the Muslims are coming, they are going to conquer our land. They try to do it once, you know, by the sword and the spear, they conquered Spain, they ruled that country for 800 years, and now they are making a comeback. We went and conquered the lands, we ruled them for hundreds of years, 300 years we ruled them in Indonesia, 100 years also we ruled them in India, or Pakistan, or Bangladesh, 500 years we ruled them in Mozambique, Muslim countries, Muslim territories, Mozambique, Musa bin Baik, a Muslim was ruling that place on the east coast of Africa, furthest down, it was a Muslim settlement. When the Portuguese, with the superior gunpowder, they conquered the Muslims and they took possession. The governor of the place was Musa bin Baik. And these people couldn't say Musa bin Baik, so they said Mozambique. Jabal Tariq, they couldn't say Jabal Tariq, they said Jabal al -Tar. See how they promoted the names. We can't imagine that this is Muslim names. Ma'manullah. With the help of Allah, our brethren, the traders, they reached the Philippines, so they said Manila. 
look, these were our places. The Muslim has been a challenge. They conquered the place, now there's a Mozambique, Musa bin Baik, Mozambique. So the Muslim is a challenge. And another publication, England, he said the Muslims are coming. This is a Christian publication. He said the Muslims are coming. At one time they were shouting, the Turks are coming, knocking at the gates of Vienna. Now the Muslims are coming. Where? To England. They have now about 300 masjids in the country. Not all like Regent's Park Mosque, but humble things. But 300 masjids in the country in a short period of time. Buying out old churches, buying synagogues, Jewish places of worship, uh, bingo halls, dancing halls, buying them over, turning them into masjids. The Muslims are coming. So we are a challenge to them. Wherever you put up a masjid, it's a challenge. But at the same time, the masjid is an attraction. It is a thing of curiosity. They want to know what is all this about. You see, because the bulk of the Westerners, they don't really know what Islam is. They confuse us. When they look at us racially, for example, me, as I'm standing here before you, I look like a man from the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent. You can mistake me for a Pathan, a Punjabi, or a Gujarati from the Bombay province. Actually, I'm from there. I'm a Hindi. I'm a man from Hind. Hindi. But they do not know, the bulk of these people, they don't know the difference between a Hindi and a Hindu. No, they don't know. They think every Hindi is a Hindu. See, Hindu is a person who follows a certain religious ideas, ideology. A Hindi means one who originates in that subcontinent called India. That's all. You could be a Muslim, you can be a Hindu, you can be a Christian, you can be a Buddhist, you can be anything. You come from there, you are a Hindi, but you are not a Hindu. But now, in my country, because the majority of the people there, people originating from the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent, are Hindus. They are Hindis and Hindus. The majority of the Indians in, the, in India, in Hind, are Hindus. So the overwhelming impression is that every Hindi is a Hindu. So, we have our masjids, and they think there is no difference between a masjid and a temple. They don't know the difference. At one stage in our history, around the 60s, the government of South Africa, they clamped down upon us. See, we had just started growing wings, and we started delivering lectures in the city halls of Durban, Johannesburg, Cape Town, these are the big centers. And the city halls are all in white areas, European areas. So we started delivering lectures on a comparative basis. What the Bible says about Muhammad. Muhammad, the natural successor to success Christ. Muhammad, the greatest. Christ in Islam was Christ crucified and on and on. We started delivering in these lectures, trying to get the people to know what Islam is. And they clamped down, not because of us, but under their own philosophy of separating the races, they call apart hate, keeping people apart. They said, no more, you can't go to the city halls, you black people, we are black people, I'm a black man. In South Africa. You see? Our chairman is a black man. <laughs> No, no, it's not the color of your skin. It's got nothing to do with the color of your skin. It's where you originate. Your origin, your fertilizer, where did it come from? If it came from Europe, you are white. If it came from Asia, you are black. It's not how white you look. No, it's, it's, that's a philosophy. That's a philosophy. Apartheid, keeping people apart. So under that philosophy, they said, no more city halls for the black people. You need a special permit 
a special license to go there. So they put stumbling blocks now to get these special licenses, very difficult. So he said, now look, necessity is the mother of invention. We need to deliver the message and now they have blocked us. What are we going to do? So he said, now what we are going to do, we are going to advertise the masjid. The masjid, we are going to advertise our masjid. They can't stop us there, that's our masjid. So we advertise the masjid. In the brochure, they reproduce the municipality, they reproduce for tourists. The places you can visit in my city, for example, they say, you know, visit the ice drome, visit the snake park, visit, you know, the native reserve and on and on. So in that we put our little advert saying, visit the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere. Our masjid in Durban, we are claiming, we are boasting that it is the largest south of the equator because there are hardly any Muslim countries south of the equator. Most of them are north of the equator, so we can boast. On Fridays we get a congregation of 4,000 people, 4,000 Muslims. So we said, the visit the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere for a free guided tour phone. <laughs> phone, and we give the phone number. And people phone, and they make appointments and they come. And people, tourists, when they come, they go to the tourist bureau. They say, look, this masjid, where is this masjid? So they'll direct, you see, you go this way, that way, and the masjid, you'll see it there, you know, in the street, from far away, you'll see the minaret. Another man, another group, they say, look, the masjid, you know, this mosque, where is the mosque? He said, look, you go like this, like that, and then you'll see, you know, a big minaret, you go there. So people are inquiring about the mosque, the mosque, the mosque. So these people, white people, are business-like people. They say, hey, this is opportunity for making, doing business. See, people want to go to the mosque, they want to go to the mosque. They say, now we will put the mosque on its tours. So they created a special tour called the Oriental Tour. They are very ingenious. The white people, they know how to do business. If there is a hunger for anything, they said, look, we'll provide, we will sell, we will do business. So they created what is called the Oriental Tour. In the Oriental Tour, the first place they come to is the Masjid. From there they go to the Indian market, where they buy curios and spices. From there they go to a place five miles out of town, where they have tea and cakes, and they show the elite Indian area. Then they drive down to the Amgeni River, and on the river bank they end off in a place called Amgeni Road, and in Amgeni Road the largest temple in South Africa is there. The largest masjid south of the equator is in Durban, and the largest temple south of the equator, I'm sorry, in South Africa is also in Durban. So people come. Now, when they read about a mosque, they do not know the difference between a mosque and a temple. They think maybe this is a synonymous term, different word meaning the same thing. So they come. They come along because they want to be entertained. They want to see something nice and funny in the masjids. That is their objective. They want to be entertained. So they come and it becomes our duty to receive these people, the tourists, explain to them what goes on and we give them free literature free literature it's an opportunity for us we created the market now we couldn't go to the centers the centers he said now you come to us and we will now deliver the message in the guise of entertainment so they come and we explain to them see the groups first thing we do as they come they say, please take off your shoes. And when we say, please take off your shoes, we know that we are, trying, we are creating a type of inconvenience for these people. Because it's not a very easy thing in the middle of the day, any time taking off the shoes. You know, if Islam allowed us, no wudu and no taking off the shoes, 
I tell you, 100% will pray five times a day. It's a wudu. He says, no, we have to take it off and make wudu and take off the shoes and your socks and all that. He says, then we we'll put it off for next time, tomorrow, inshallah. This is it, weakness, human weakness. Shoes, taking off the socks, all that. So, we're making the non-Muslim, please take off your shoes. And because it's a type of inconvenience, we know it's an inconvenience, we are causing them. So he said, do you know why you're taking off your shoes? The answer is always, no. Would you like to know? Nobody ever says he doesn't want to know. You see, it's the nature of man, he wants to know why. We are all inquisitive, we want to know why. We say, you remember? When Moses was on Mount Sinai, God spoke to him and he said, so saying, we quote from the Christian Bible, which is common to both the Jews and the Christians. That portion, which is common to them both. And God said, and he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. You see, in respect of that commandment, we Muslims, we take off our shoes. We are not discriminating against you, because as you see, and we show them, we also take off our shoes when we enter this house of prayer. You leave no scope for arguments. Instead of telling the man, telling the people, the old-fashioned way, my father used to do. He says, you know you people, you go to the lavatory, the toilet with the shoes, same shoes you go to the church, you got no respect for the house of God, but we are a nice clean people. Look, it is so, but it's creating offense. But what we do now, he says, no, 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 there's so many ways of killing a cat. We say in Urdu, ke saap bhi mare aur lathi bina tute. You kill the snake without breaking the stick. In other words, you teach the man without creating offense. Says so we are only following in the footsteps of your prophets. Whatever God commanded your prophets in your own books to do, we are following them. No arguments. No arguments. I says, you know, before we go into pray, we make ablution, wudu. All the exposed parts of the body are being washed. The hands, the feet, the nostrils, the nape of the neck, gargling the mouth, brushing the teeth. I said, this the Muslim does five times a day, every day of the year. The one who is particular with his prayers. And purely from the hygienic point of view, no one is going to find fault with the person who washes himself five times a day. It's a good hygienic practice. And they all agree. It's a good hygienic practice. I say it also serves certain psychological purposes. Meaning, mentally it's preparing the person for prayer. I say we are not washing because we are dirty. We are washing because we are going to face our Lord, we are going to stand before our Maker. So psychologically, mentally, we are being prepared. Now I'm telling you all this, not for entertainment. I'm telling you this, I said, look, this is what can be done. How you can exploit the situation. How you can make use of the masjids, the massages in the West. And even in the East. I will tell you how you can use them here as well. The same technique. How the masjid, how it can serve in our work. I said, thirdly, secondly, psychological, thirdly, I said, this is also another commandment given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. In the book of Exodus, that is the second book of the Bible, this is the Christian Bible, in the second book of this Bible, it is written, and Moses and Aaron and the sons, washed their hands and their feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. I say, in respect of that commandment, we do all these things. We wash ourselves. This is what Moses did, and this is what Aaron and the son, the children, they all did. They washed, means they made wudu before going into the house of prayer. We do the same. No arguments. Hygienically it's a good thing, psychologically it's a good thing, and thirdly, this is a fulfillment of the teachings of your prophets in your own book. Now, we say, we will go, this is all done, outside. We have a pool, 
for making wudu with taps right round. And on one of the seats we stand up and explain. Now they are ready to go inside in the masjid. This is come. We will now go into the main house of prayer and I will demonstrate to you how we pray. Now they think they're going to see something nice and funny. You demonstrate. Maybe you do the dance of the darwishes or something of the kind, you know, do something funny. Mm -hmm. And they are, they are looking forward to it. We will now demonstrate to you how we pray. So we get them in the masjid, make them sit behind against the wall. I said, sit against the wall, be comfortable, rest. I said, the walls are air-conditioned. Just a joke, they're not air-conditioned. I said, it's nice and cooling. Sit down on the ground, on the carpet. It's an experience of a lifetime. You will never forget, and that is true, they'll never forget. Sit down on the carpet. You don't talk to them, taking them around and, you know, this is the masjid and this is the mihrab. No, 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 sit down. Because once a man sits down, it's hard for him to get up in a hurry. Yes, sit down, relaxed. So now, from there, South Africa, I'm talking to them, sitting against the wall. From there, our masjids are facing north, because we are the south. So we are facing north. So we say, as you are seated here, you are all facing north. And every mosque in South Africa, they face north. You know why? Because Mecca is to the north of South Africa. But if you go to the east, you'll find all the mosques are facing west. From the western countries, they're all facing east. And from the north, they are facing south. It is quite a queer arrangement. Funny arrangement. As each facing the other. It is funny. You facing this side, the other fellow facing you. And the other one's facing this side. It's quite a queer arrangement. It is queer. But I says, you know, why? I say, all the attention of the Muslim world focus on to one spot, Mecca, to symbolize the unity of the Muslim people, that they have a common direction of prayer. Not, not that God is there. Because the Holy Quran tells us, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِكُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ To Allah belongs the East and the West. فَأَيْنَ مَا تُوَلُّوا فَسَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ And whichever way you turn is the presence of Allah. In other words, God Almighty is omnipresent. He's present everywhere. Whether you look up, or you look down, or you look sideways. He's everywhere. This only symbolizes our unity. Facing in that direction, we say, Allahu Akbar, meaning Allah is the greatest. We signify that we divorce ourselves from all earthly things, and we will solely contemplate on God. So saying, we read chapters and verses from the Holy Quran celebrating the praises of God. And we go into different postures. And in every posture, we celebrate His praises. And we demonstrate. Say so from this position, we go into what you call ruku, a semi-bent position. And in that position we say, Subhana Rabbil Azim, Subhana Rabbil Azim, Subhana Rabbil Azim. Glory to God the Great, Glory to God the Great, Glory to God the Great. From there we arise, saying, Sami Allahu liman hamida, which Allah listens to the one that praises Him. We have the assurance that our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, who is closer to us than our jugular veins, as the Holy Quran testifies, that we are indeed closer to you than your very life veins. We stand up with the assurance that He listens to our prayers. He listens to our secret thoughts, our feelings, our emotions. And with that assurance we arise, and from that position we say, Allahu Akbar, and we go into prostration sujood. And we do it. We go into the sizda, demonstrating. We said, look, we'll demonstrate. We demonstrate down to the ground. Forehead touching the earth. I say, in that position we say, Subhana Rabbiyal A'la, Subhana Rabbiyal A'la, Subhana Rabbiyal A'la. Which means glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest. The highest part of man goes down to the lowest before his maker and we praise him to the highest. This is the form of our prayer. And this is also biblical. 
think this is according to your book, your kitab. Because this is how all the prophets pray. This is how all the prophets prayed. And when you say that, it sounds like a sweeping generalization. I said, look, it sounds like a sweeping generalization, but it is not so. If you have been reading your own holy scriptures, your own book, you will be able to confirm what I'm going to quote you now. And I quote from the Old Testament in the Bible, the Old Testament, Kitabul Kadim. That's the title. That's what they say, Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it reads, And Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And again, And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And again, And Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. When we come to the New Testament, I say we read that towards his last days on earth, Jesus Christ, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, and he said, wait and watch. Look out, be careful, keep guard. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. See, there we demonstrate. And he went a little further and fell on his face and we fall on our faces. Sujud. And getting up, he said, and prayed to God. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, meaning remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. In the end, I leave it to you. Oh, my Lord, I want you to save me. But as a Muslim, he submits his will to the will of God. As a Muslim, he made the sujood. So we are asking, how does a man fall on his face and pray? Except the way we Muslims do. Is there another way? Can a circus acrobat do any better than that? No, he can't. So, he said, you see, while the man is scanning in his head, he says, no, there is no other way. So he said, look, this is how Abraham and Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Jesus and Muhammad, this is how they humble themselves before the Lord. And we are not ashamed to do likewise. But the modern gentleman, referring to him, but the modern gentleman is more worried about the creases on his trousers and humbling before God. No going down and all that, you know, the creases will get spoiled. <laughs> I said, you see, the Americans today are spending millions to learn what they call transcendental meditation. A word two years long. They're learning this from the Hindus. Transcendental meditation. I say a word two years long from the Hindus and they are paying thousands of dollars in the process. I says, all that transcendental medita meditation in Islam, you get it free of charge. We want to share it with you. Now, the one that we worship, we call him Allah. The one before whom we humble ourselves, we call him Allah and Muhammad is not our Allah. This is what they're thinking. They're thinking we worship the Holy Prophet Muhammad We have to explain to them that Muhammad is not our Allah. He was a man like any other human being, born of a woman. And the Bible tells us in the book of Job, chapter 25, verse 4, it says, how then can man be justified with God? How can you compare any human being with God, with Allah? How can he be clean that is born of a woman? Anyone that a woman carries for nine months, he is not even clean enough to be compared with Allah. Compared to us, they are great. They are like the towering peaks of the Himalayas. The prophets of God. They are like the towering peaks of the Himalayas. We look up to them with love, respect and reverence. But we say, what is the Himalayas compared to the heavens? Nothing. Nothing. 29,000 feet, when Hillary and Tenzing, when they went, they climbed the Himalayas, they said they conquered the Himalayas, it was world news. Achievement, 29,000 feet. What is this 29,000 feet compared to the heavens? Nothing. Likewise we say, the prophets of God, compared to us, they are very great. No comparison. 
There is no comparison between us and the prophets of God. We don't compare ourselves with Ibrahim alayhi salam, or Musa alayhi salam, or Dawud alayhi salam, or Isa alayhi salam, or Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa alayhi salam. No, no, no. There is no comparison. But compared to God Almighty, what are they? Nothing. Compared to us, we are nothing compared to them, and they are also nothing compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I says, this is how we respect and we, we estimate. No comparison. And the one that we worship, we call him Allah. And why Allah? We will now hear the azan. And after the azan, I will explain to you how we explain the azan to the people. And then we are going to make Isha, as the brother will announce. You know, we'll make it a little late. We will continue as the brother will explain. If you will explain how we are going to arrange after the azan. So, what is the arrangement? We will continue after the adhan, yes. and the, uh, the prayer is going, inshallah, is going to be after the translation. Okay. And the Salat al-Isha will be after the translation, inshallah. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله حي على الصلاة Azan, the Muslim call to prayer, five times a day, every day of the year, the Muazzin, he goes on top of the minaret, he goes on top of the minaret, because in the good old days, we didn't have mic systems, here we are doing from here, and the horns are carrying on the message from the outside, from the minarets, but previously the Muazzin, poor man, he had to climb, right to the top, so his voice can travel. So he goes on top of the minaret and he shouts in a loud sonorous voice. He says, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Meaning, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. Four times. Then he says, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. That I bear witness that there is no other object of worship but Allah. He repeats it twice. That the only one who deserves to be worshipped is Him. He continues, 
Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He repeats it twice. If you accept these two fundamentals, that there is but one God, one Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger, then what is the message? The Muazzin continues. So, Hayya ala salat, he said, come to prayer. Hayya ala salat, he said, come to prayer. Hayya ala al falah, he said, come to success. Hayya ala al falah, he said, come to success. Because this is real success. That you remind yourselves about your duties and obligations towards your Creator and your duties and obligations towards your fellow human beings. If you want to be successful, there is no other way. And he winds up the call by saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, that Allah is still the greatest. Allah is still the greatest. Whether you come or you do not come, you are not going to lower him in his exaltation, in his majesty, in his glory, he still remains supreme. And the final words of warning he gives, the Muazzin, he gives, La ilaha illallah, that there is no other object of worship but Allah. You can keep on worshipping your man gods, your money gods, your woman gods. But remember this, that the only one who deserves to be worshipped is Allah. This is the national anthem of the Muslims wherever they live. And when you hear the call, you do not have to ask who is ringing the bell. Like in Christianity, whether it's a Roman Catholic or a Dutch Reformed Church, it is an RC or a DRC, you don't have to ask. You can hearken to the call, whether you're in China, whether you're in Nigeria, whether you're in Turkey, whether you're in England, when you hear the call, you can hearken to the call. National anthem of the Muslims, wherever they live. Now the one we worship, the one before whom we prostrate ourselves, we call him Allah. And as I said, Muhammad is not our Allah. We prefer this word Allah to the English word God. Because this English word God is often misused or misapplied. You see, in English, we are talking English, I'm speaking English. In English, we have a plural of gods. God is gods. God, and you have more than one, you say gods. You have a woman gods, you call them goddesses. You have a small gods, you call them godlings. Yes, that's English. You know, little gods and godlings. Whereas this Arabic word Allah is absolutely unique. You see, Arabic has its rules of grammar like any other language. But in Arabic, you can't make a plural of Allah, you can't make a feminine of Allah, and you can't make a diminutive. Allah. Unique word. Ask the Arabs. Ask them. Come on. I want to In the Arabic, can you say Allah's? Can you? Huh? Can you say a woman Allah? Can you say? I don't know. <laughs> like goddess. You see, this Arabic, this English word God, they speak about gods and goddesses who ate and drank, who wrangled and plotted, carried away the wives of other gods. In English, if you are looking after somebody's child as a guardian, they say you are a godfather to the child, and the woman, your wife, is a godmother to the child. Godmother to the child. This word is so abused; you can use it anyhow as you like. Allah Bari Taala has preserved us from that. You can't do anything. We prefer this word to the English word Allah, a God. Now, what you are doing now, you are giving him the concept. See, and again and again, we emphasize that Muhammad is not our Allah because they are thinking that maybe we accept Christ as our Lord, God, maybe you accept Muhammad as your Lord, God. We have to assure them that we are not displacing Jesus Christ with Muhammad to say, Jesus is not God, but Muhammad is. We do not tell you that Jesus is not the Son of God, but Muhammad is the Son of God. We do not tell you that Christ didn't die for your sins, Muhammad died for your sins. No, we think nothing. We talk nothing of the kind. It's quite a different thing altogether. We are inviting you all to the worship of the one true God, the one that Jesus worshipped. And Jesus called him Allah. And they get the shock. As the name of God Almighty, 
In your Bible is Allah. In the Semitic languages, in the language of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad وسلم, the name of God Almighty is Allah. But in your Bible, there is not a Bible in the world. The Christians have translated this Bible into 2,000 different languages. 2,000 different languages. And this word, Allah, is to be found in every language of the world. Amazing! You know, this is a miracle, it's a mojiz of a highest order. That in the New Testament of the Christians, Old and New, the Old New Testament, everything after Jesus, in the original manuscripts, what they call original, in Greek, the word Jehovah is not there. There is a group of people, among the Christians call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. Witnesses to Yahweh. They are really claiming to be the witnesses to Allah. That's what they're claiming. And they say the name of God Almighty is Jehovah. He says, you know, this was Jehovah in the 27 books of the New Testament. There are 27 books. The word Jehovah is not there. In the original, it's not there. Amazing. And you ask them, when you meet them in the flesh, I said, who would be one thing to get rid of God's name? If this is His name, if the name of God Almighty is not Allah but Jehovah, all right, who would be one thing to get eliminate such a name? Who? So he'll tell you straight away, the devil. So right, who's right? If the name of God is Jehovah, or the name of God Almighty is Allah, who would want to get rid of that word Allah? Who? Shaitan. It's logical. So I said, you see, in your 27 books, the word Jehovah is not there. And you say Jehovah inspired the books. Why would Jehovah himself, the inspirer, not want to have his name inside? Unless he's ashamed of his name. He must have done something horrible. Like Hitler. You know, he's ashamed. His own name. God Almighty is ashamed of his name. In the 27 books, not once. But in your books, the name Allah is there. The name Jehovah is not there in the 27 books. Not once, but Allah is still there. He said, Way. I said, you see, you are looking at it, you see it, you utter it, you hear it, and you still you don't grasp it. <laughs> it's an amazing situation. See, Allah says, Thummum bukmun umyun fahum la Deaf, dumb and blind, they will not return to the path. I said, you see it, you utter it, you hear it, and you still don't catch it. He <laughs> said, so what are you talking about? You know, it's fun. Allah, it's fun. To do Allah's work, it's fun. It's a pleasant thing. You just do a little bit of homework. This little book here. Hmm. This little book here. The Muslim at prayer. I don't know whether it's available here in Dubai. Print it. I said, print it. The Muslim at prayer. It gives you all this. This little dynamite. All what I'm telling you, the quotations are here. This book won't teach you how to make salat. No, no, you have other books for that. This only teaches you everything that the Muslim does is in his book. Taking off the shoes. What the Quran says, what the Bible says. The Azan, what the Quran says, what the Bible says. Prayer. In the house of God, no idols, no images. What the Quran says, what the Bible says. Sujood, what the Quran says, what the Bible says. Wudu, what the Quran says, what the Bible says. Every aspect of Muslim prayer is to be found in his book. He is not aware of it. And we, as bad as we are, we are saying we are trying to follow in the footsteps of the prophets. But we are sitting on this knowledge. We are sitting on it. We don't share it. You see, the glory is in sharing. You know what you're doing to them? When you explain to them, when you are explaining to them these things, you know what is happening to them? When you see, they come along, salat times sometimes, salat times, and they sit at the back and they watch. And when we go into the sujood, you don't know what is going through their heart and mind. But there's nothing there, man. There's nothing there. And this man has bowed down to the ground. The impact that has upon the unbeliever. Impact. You don't know. But you want to keep him out. You don't want him to see. They are thinking that you're worshipping the idol of Muhammad inside the masjid. You know that? When they come inside, 
they look at the masjid, our masjid like yours, maybe a little more fancy than this masjid. Say a little more fancy. With the word Allah, Muhammad, and nice some nice words say terrazzo, what do you call that? Nice beautiful stones. Yes. So they ask, We are your gods. Your gods. <laughs> yes. So we said, look, we have no idols and images here. They said, do you only take them out on Fridays? You know, for giving fresh air to your gods? Maybe you keep them away somewhere. They said, no, not even on Fridays. Because they see that our Muslims, we close our shops on Fridays between 12 and 1. So they said, maybe you take them out for fresh air, your gods, give them fresh air. They said, no, not even on Fridays. And they can't believe. They can't believe. And they're looking at me, they said, this guy is a Hindi, Indian. See? And now he's saying he hasn't got it. Something fishy. Two university students, they came along. Same type of, same question. Always, always the same type of questions. Where are your gods? So when it was finished, he said, what have you got on the top? We have a second floor. So he said, no, it's a hall like this. And on Fridays, the overflow of the congregation also goes to the top. So he said, can we have a look? I said, of course you can have a look. So all right, I took them to the top. They look around, it's simpler than at the bottom. They said, what have you got on the top? <laughs> they said, no, it's a flat roof, and twice a year during our festival eats, the congregation also goes to the top. He said, can we have a look? They said, all right, now nice. I've done, taken so much trouble, I might as well satisfy. Right, right to the roof. And from there you can only see the rooftops of other buildings. So, they have a look around, there's nothing there to see. So they start walking down the steps, and one fellow tells the other, he says, you know, it's true, they have no idols here. They were searching them out. Maybe he says, you don't want to show them, you hid them away somewhere. They can't believe, because we didn't educate them. We didn't tell them anything. The fault is ours, it's not theirs. One English lady, during a, her world tour, to, she comes to the masjid with a group. And when the explanation is given about Islam, she said, I expected to find a funny oriental museum a la carte. But instead, I found the truth. What she meant was, I would have found in the mosque, she thought, a monkey got for Monday, elephant got for Tuesday, a snake got for Wednesday, all the gods lined up. That's what she expected. But instead, she says, I found the truth. Another lady, during the school holiday, she comes with the two daughters. The ruling race, the Africana, the ruling people. Supposed to be educated people, enlightened people. Yes, they come. They come to the mosque. And having a look around, she's disappointed. She's looking for something, it's not there. So she's asking, where are the cows? Cows, guy, kahan hai, guy, dono ki. Bakara, bakara. So I'm asking, Madam, have you lost your cows? <laughs> she says, no. No, I promised to, sh to show them to my daughters. I said, Madam, you have come to the wrong place. So, but she said, I promised them. I said, Madam, is that my fault? You promised to show cows in the mosque? I said, no, no. Well, I want to assure you. Look, you want to see cows? You can see them. They are not far from here, in Amgeni Road. No, about two kilometers from there, there is a Hindu temple, they are my people, they look like me, we have the same surnames, we look alike, we speak the same language, Wallah, there's no, there's no exaggeration. They are my people, they look like me, and you'll find everything there, all that you're looking for, you'll find them there. But we are Muslims, we believe in Allah, we worship the unseen God of the universe, who is beyond the imagination of the mind of man. We know He exists, we know He is real, but He's not like anything we can think or imagine. That is God that we worship. And they ask endless questions. These are God sent opportunities. They are asking questions. We want them to ask questions. That is how you educate people. They want to know about our women. You say in the mosque prayer time, there no women. Don't the women pray in Islam? He said, yes, they do pray, but he said, we don't see any. He says, no, there is what is called a segregation of the sexes. Men and women are not allowed to freely intermingle. So in the absence of a separate facility, 
They pray at home. But I said, you see there, the new structure going up? That is specially for ladies. They will be like in the mosque and yet out of the mosque. There is no free intermingling. Islam forbids free intermingling. You see, no Muslim has a right to be alone with a woman who is not his mother, his wife, his sister, his daughter. Anybody else? Respectable distance. I said, what Islam forbids is this free intermingling. I said, you see, you saw when you came in the place where we make the ablution. Now, the Muslim man and the woman, they both have to go through the same process. Same process. They must also take off the shoes. They must also make wudu. Everything the man does, the woman must do. But if they are together, side by side, then on the seats you saw, the man is sitting and the woman is sitting. The man is sitting and the woman is sitting. And they're making ablution. They'll have to do. And there's a man sitting across. And this woman is washing her hands, her face, nape of the neck, her feet, lifting up her legs, washing her feet. And she may be wearing what they call a hot pant, hot pant. And there's a man sitting across. I said, you know, madam, you won't feel comfortable. Suppose you were that Muslim lady. You won't feel comfortable. And he agrees. And there's a man sitting on your right hand side. There's a man sitting on your left hand side. You won't feel comfortable. She agrees. They agree. I said, you see then, we are standing in a queue. Prayer time, behind every tap there are half a dozen people. Behind every tap. Prayer time, everybody, there's a rush. And I said, madam, let's say you are making the ablution and I'm waiting for my turn. I said, you know, while you're making that ablution, washing your hands, your feet, throwing your tresses around, making the massage. I said, you know, I won't be thinking of God. I'll be thinking of what lovely hands you got, what lovely arms, look at the tresses, beautiful tresses. This is man, any man, unless he is a hypocrite or there's something else wrong with him. <laughs> man, woman, the thing that attracts man more than anything else on this earthly existence is woman. And Allah tells you so. He says, Zuyina linna suhubbu shahwati minan nisa. Fair in the sight of men is the things... The, love, the, the things they covet, and number one, min nisa wal banin wal kanati ril mukantarati min zahabi wal fiddah. First one, woman. And he said, look, I don't have to prove that to you. In the house of prayer, we stand shoulder to shoulder. These are all the explanations we give. We stand shoulder to shoulder. No gaps left between one devotee and another. You know why? Because the holy prophet Muhammad, he said that when when you stand up for prayer, you must not leave gaps for the devil, shaitan, to get in between you and your brother. I says, I know. When we talk about the devil, it sounds very superstitious, backward. But I said, the shaitan that Muhammad was talking about was not the guy we see in the art gallery. We have an art gallery. Beautiful paintings by great artists. Art gallery. I said, you see there, a beautiful woman with wings. A beautiful woman with wings, well proportioned. They give the perfect proportion, 36, 24, 36, old measurement, inches, 36, 24, 36. That's supposed to be the most perfect proportion to the Westerner. 36, 24, 36, well proportioned, with wings. And you see a devil in the picture. In the picture you can show everything. And this woman, this wing, angel, she's got a stick in her hand, wand, and she's pointing to hell. And you see hell in the distance. In the picture, you can show all that. And the devil is flying away. And this devil has got wings, he's got horns, he's got sharp ears, and he's got a tail with a barbed hook. I said, that devil, if you saw one, you'll run for dear life. Me too, me too. I run for dear life. Muhammad was not talking about that devil. He was talking about you, yourself. Your racial pride. Your arrogance. Your riches. I'm rich. He's poor. I'm white. He's black. That devil must not be allowed to come in between you and your brother. So we stand shoulder to shoulder. No gaps left for that shaitan. That shaitan. Not the other one with horns or with tail. But as instead of my brother, you, I have my sister, you standing shoulder to shoulder. And I say, Allahu Akbar. So Allah is the greatest. But my mind starts wondering whether you know the greatest. <laughs> no, nice, comfortable feeling, cushy feeling. And in winter, you can feel that one degree difference. Yes. 
Physiologists, they say there is always one degree difference in temperature, average temperature between men and women. And that one degree is perceptible. You can feel it. <laughs> or you're standing in front. Because we stand rows and rows behind each other. We are in the front row. And I say, Allah Akbar. I see 36, 24, 36. <laughs> this is man, any man. Unless he's a lunatic, or there's something else wrong with him. This is how God made us. And I said, look, I don't have to prove this to you. I said, you know it. You Westerners, you know this weakness of man, and you're exploiting it to the hilt, to the limit. I said, you know, in Durban, in my city, there's a firm called Lucian Motors. They sell second-hand trucks. But on the trucks that they advertise, there's a woman in the bikini on top of the truck. G Knots, they sell farm implements. And on the tractors that they advertise, there's a woman in the bikini on top of the tractor. So I'm asking, what has a woman in the bikini got to do with a second-hand truck or with a tractor? Except the man. He'll be enticed to read because she's being dangled before him. See, what are you doing? I said, BMW. It's a motor car supposed to be a little better than the Mercedes-Benz in my country. A little more expensive. I'm not in a market for it. But I said, you know, in the newspaper, if you did back I saw an advert BMW motor car and I had to read it you know why because in front of this motor car was a woman in the skimpiest of bikini what they call the tanga the g-string well proportioned woman almost naked and she's standing with a lustful enticing pose as if she's calling you and at the bottom is written test drive her now <laughs> and the her is underlined who the woman of the car She's barring the car. I said, what are you doing to your women folk? Hmm? The Holy Prophet Muhammad has said that they are your mothers, your sisters, your daughters. They are wives. They have to be respected, honored, and protected. They are not for sale. Tell you the impact that it has. One lady tells me before she's leaving, he said, why don't you come and tell this to my people? Tell them! They are being exploited. But, my dear brothers and sisters, you see, there is so much, it's so easy, wallah. We here, I know you haven't got the opportunity that we have. You haven't got so many tourists. In Abu Dhabi, I don't know the tourists, where can they go? Masjid every corner. The masjids are empty. As our great poet Iqbal, he says, Masjid e marthiya ha hai ke namazi na rahe, yane wo sahib al safi hijazi na rahe. The masjids are mourning places. They're crying that there are no people for making prayer. I said, fill up the masjids. You are not enough. You are very sparsely populated. You've got so many masjids. Convert the people. There are people here. Allah has sent them to your door. Why don't you give deen to them? Look, you were supposed to go out and look for them. Allah has sent them to your door. He's given you wealth, all of a sudden, given you wealth, so they come to you looking for jobs. The Korean is here, the Filipino is here, the Sri Lankan is here, the, the Hindu from India is here. Why don't you talk to him? Why don't you bring them to the masjid? Just let them sit down and see what we are doing. Explain to them the unseen God of the universe that we are worshipping. Allah will make us to account for it. They are working for you in the houses. Christian women. And your children are imbibing Christianity from them. Unwittingly. They are not deliberately trying to convert your children. But I heard a Saudi gentleman telling me, he says, you know, my child when he sat down, he was doing like this. I said, did you teach him? He said, no. Did your wife teach him? He said, no. He says, the nanny. Because she does. She's not teaching the child, but every time she's away. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So your child is also doing the same. Yes. One brother was telling me, he says he was talking about God. God. So he says, you know, the God is in the cupboard. <laughs> telling a, a little three or four year old child, he says, the God is in the cupboard. So what? He says, yes, daddy come. He takes the child, the girl, little girl takes, five year old girl takes the father to the cupboard and they found the statues inside. Yes. So now this is, look, change them. No force. No compulsion. Don't threaten them. Don't say, if you don't become a Muslim, I'm going to kick you out. No, 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 no. 
share with them. Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati. Invite all to the ways of thy Lord with wisdom. Wal mawazatil hasanati and with beautiful preaching. Wajadilhum billati ahsan. And reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. And make use of your masjids not only for salat and for funeral prayer but for everything. With these words, I'm very, very grateful for the Ministry of uh, uh, Information for bringing me to your country. Actually, I had come here to thank the people for the help they had given me when I was going to debate that guy Swagat. You see, for the help that the people had given me. Without that, I would not have been projected into America. I was rocketed into America by you people. So I had come to say thank you. But more than that, instead of me saying thank you, in my honor, in the honor of Islam, they replayed the tapes in Arabic and in English from Abu Dhabi TV. So making life impossible for me. The love. You know, I delivered a lecture. I don't know when. Wednesday night, I can't remember now. What was that? At Tuesday night. And I had to run for life from there. I had to come one o'clock in the morning, reach here. I don't want people to know where, where I am. <laughs> it's the love you have for me. I can't walk in the streets. Everybody want to pump my hand. Everybody want to kiss my hand. Now people want to kiss my forehead. <laughs> I'm in the sweat. You want to kiss the sweat. I said, look, please. <laughs> Do yourself some justice. So, you know, the thing is I can't match. Your love and feeling you have for me, I can't match it. So I have to find ways and means of leaving you and running away. Wallah. I have to run because I can't match it. May Allah bari ta'ala reward you for the love and feeling. It's the love and feeling you have for Islam that brings you to listen to me. Otherwise, what do you want to come and see this old man? What is there? But it's your love for deen that brings you to listen to me. So may Allah bari ta'ala bless you and strengthen you that you may carry on his message and use the masjid also as a place of da'wah. Wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.